Hello everyone. Today we'll talk about herpes viruses. Now these are uh, a group of DNA viruses. Okay, so this can cause a variety of infections. We'll have a short description about uh, what these viruses are and what disease they cause. So first of all, the herpes virus is a spherical virus with a icosahedral symmetry, what we call it. And it has a double-stranded DNA, which is enveloped viruses. So you know that viruses, basically, you can talk, uh, when you talk about viruses, you can say that they are enveloped or non-enveloped virus. So this one is a enveloped virus. And the beauty of this virus is it can stay in the body without causing any kind of clinical symptoms for a long time. And it can cause infection at a later date. And the most important thing is, this infection can recur many times. That is, it can get reactivated many times and it can cause infections. This virus uh, replicates or divides in the, not exactly divides, it replicates in the host cell nucleus. And when they divide like that, they uh, multiply like that, they develop some inclusion bodies, which is intranuclear inclusion bodies, which are called as a cowdry type A inclusion bodies. So this is what it looks like. In the nucleus, you can see a darker area. So those are the cowdry type A inclusion bodies, which is like the properly the nuclear area is highlighted and there's a clear halo surrounding that area. So when you look at the uh, structure, you have a icosahedral virus type of the uh, shape with the 162 capsomeres. So what is the basic structure of this virus? It has a genetic material. Here it is a double-stranded DNA. Surrounding that, you have a capsid. So we all know that uh, the genetic material and capsid alone is enough for a virus to be active. right? So next you have a lipid envelope which is carried off from the host cell when it comes out after replication. Surrounding that you have some surface spikes that is for the purpose of attachment and in between the capsid and the uh, lipid envelope you have something called as a tegmental layer. Okay. So once again you see you have a basic genetic material, you have a capsid which basically protects the genetic material, you have a lipid envelope and you have the surface spikes and in between the uh, lipid envelope and the capsid you have what is called as a Now we will look into the classification as such. So this is based on <clears throat> what is formally called, what is the family and what is the new word name for. So you have a herpes simplex virus 1 which is an alpha type of virus and it is called as a herpes virus 1. Then you have a herpes simplex 2 which is again an alpha virus which is called the human herpes virus 2. The varicella zoster, which is basically causes chicken pox. It's again an alpha virus named as a human herpes virus type 3. You have an Epstein Barr virus, which is a gamma virus, which is called type 4. And cytomegalovirus virus is again a beta virus, which is called a type. Same so way, you have 6, 7, 8, 8. So we'll go through one by one and we'll see what is the difference. So, first, we'll talk about the classification where you have an alpha herpes virus. So, basically, it has a very short replicative site means it replicates very fast and it can affect a wide range of cells or wide host range. So it might divide within around 12 to 18 hours and it will nicely settle in the sensory ganglia. Even cell cultures will be able to grow it very easily and there will be uh, basically the cytopathic effects on the cell cultures will be quite high. So examples would be your pressure simplex virus and your varicella zoster virus. Next, we have the beta herpes virus, which is slightly slower replication compared to the earlier alpha herpes virus. Have a narrow uh, range of cells. There are very few cells which they will infect, and they will grow very well in the fibroblast. They will enlarge the cells in which they are growing, and even cell culture, that is your tissue culture, also will grow slowly, and it will remain with the cell. I mean, if only the cell is there, the virus will be. Uh, multiplying and will be active. So 
For example, is your cytomegalovirus. Then you have the gamma viruses, which basically replicate only in the uh, B cells or T cells. And the example for this is uh, Epstein Barr virus. The antigen, that is, all these eight viruses, they don't have a common group antigen, and they can be a uh, very minimal cross reaction between these viruses except for HSV1 and HSV2. We'll talk about herpes virus or herpes simplex infection, which is basically only seen in human beings. Okay, And the HSV1 is basically seen from the lesions in and around the oral cavity, and it has to be transmitted in a very close contact, either from direct contact or a very close droplet spread of infection. The HSV2 is basically responsible for all the genital lesions and obviously it is transmitted venerally. And this virus will grow in a chorioelectroid membrane in your uh, egg cultures and you have different cell lines in which you can grow. So some of them are your monkey kidney cell lines, rabbit kidney cell lines, human amnion cell lines or HeLa cell lines. Now this virus between the herpes virus 1 and herpes virus 2 can be differentiated based on monoclonal antibodies as well as your restriction endonucleases. The type 2 strains will grow very well on the chorioelectroid membrane and when you try to do animal inoculation, there will be more effect on the central nervous system or it's called as a neurovirulence and uh, these are very resistant to antiviral agents and the infectivity is much more uh, related to the temperature. So as the temperature fluctuates, there can be also a drop or gain in the infectivity. Now, if you look at the pathogenesis, and it's the most common viral infections, and as we told earlier, it is the human beings are the only hosts. The general infection happens in a childhood, and uh, it may be because of the uh, infected uh, saliva, skin lesions, or respiratory sec secretions, and uh, uh, some people who are asymptomatic but carriers can spread this infection. HSV2 happens to be a close contact infection. So what happens? So the herpes simplex virus breaks through the epithelium. It will nicely multiply there itself first of all. Then it will slowly en enter the nerves, cutaneous nerve fibers. And via the nerve fibers, they will travel into the ganglia. Then again multiply there. And from there, they will again migrate to the skin and mucosa in which direction the particular nerve trans, uh, transmits its signals, the same direction the infection will also spread. So HSV type 1 will uh, have affinity for staying in the trigeminal nerve, whereas the HSV type 2 will have an affinity for the sacral nerves. And this uh, antibodies do not have much of an effect on this viral infection. And maybe they can reduce the severity of symptoms, but does not uh, basically reduce the disease. The most important thing what you need is a proper cell-mediated immunity, which is important for handling this particular infection. So what are the lesions you are going to see? There's a thin-walled lesions. Uh, in the center, there will be a small tip, so it's called as umbilicated vesicles. So this will slowly break down and the nearby ones will join together and will form superficial ulcers. These ulcers will eventually heal without much of a scarring. Classically, we say that HSV1 produces lesions above the waist and HSV2 produces lesions below the waist. Okay. Now, the HSV2 uh, infection may protect against the patient developing herpes simplex 1 virus infection, but the opposite does not happen. Clinically, what do you see? You see some uh, lesions over the cheeks, chin, mouth, and forehead. And sometimes uh, there can be a reactivation of these lesions whenever the patient uh, develops a uh, uh, fever. And uh, other conditions uh, like when, whenever the patient is having some uh, respiratory infection, exposure to sun, uh, very much stressed, or some in some patients, even during uh, the menstrual cycles, they can be uh, activation or reactivation of this infection. Very rarely, uh, some of the uh, infections can happen in particular occupations like uh, doctors, dentists, where uh, the lesions are more commonly on the fingertips. Sometimes the uh, 
children with eczema can also develop this kind of an uh, infection which is called as a eczema herpeticum. Uh, they can be mucosal infections where it is uh, probably comes as gingival stomatitis, pharyngitis and recurrent herpes labialis. And the infection, uh, since it is there and it has already opened up the cutaneous uh, barrier, so they can be secondary infections or secondary bacterial infections can also happen. One of the most important cause or one of the most important uh, effects of this virus is the corneal blindness. So there can be uh, acute keratoconjunctivitis because the uh, infection has happened at the face. There can be uh, follicular conjunctivitis with vesicles on the eyelids. Uh, they can form a dendritic ulcers on the cornea. And uh, the in any kind of a viral infection, generally steroids are contraindicated. Same way in this also, it gets contaminated because it may lead to deeper involvement. Instead of uh, handling the infection, it can worsen the infection. Sometimes or very rarely, they can be polioretinitis or acute uh, necrotizing retinitis. Nervous system involvement, pure nervous system involvement or the central nervous system is pretty much rare, uh, but it's known to happen. So some of the examples are your uh, herpes simplex virus encephalitis, herpes simplex virus meningitis, they can be sacral autonomic dysfunction, Guillain-Barre syndrome, Bell's palsy, and uh, some of the other organs that can be infected as well. So it can lead to esophagitis, trichobronchitis, pneumonitis, hepatitis, and disseminated infection. So genital herpes, it was uh, much common in the olden days. Uh, so males would develop lesions on the penis or urethra, leading to urethritis. Women will uh, have lesions on the cervix, vagina, vulva, or perineum. So initially start with fever and uh, malaise, which is uh, slowly the, uh, the same kind of symptoms keep on recurring with the lesions. The lesions are very much painful. And if it is a homosexual uh, person, there can be lesions on the uh, rectum and perineal areas. The another uh, important type is a congenital herpes. Uh, which is a transplantal placental infection with HSV 1 or 2. Uh, whenever the mother is infected and uh, the infection when the baby uh, comes out to the birth, birth passage, it can uh, lead to a congenital infection, which can be avoided by doing a uh, caesarean uh, section and the baby can be uh, born without much of a trouble. Now, the postnatal infection is also very much common. So, what happens here? The neonatal infections will be remitted to eyes, mouth or the skin and uh, more common one is of uh, the infection because the baby's immune system is not fully developed. It can have a multi-system involvement with or without encephalitis. The problem here is the uh, mortality rate is very much high and if the baby survives, it can have some amount of neurological deficits. Diagnosis wise, first of all, you need what samples you are going to be taking. So you have uh, vesicle fluids, skin swabs, saliva, corneal scrapings uh, it can be taken. If there is a neural involvement, they can be a, a CSF can be obtained. If unfortunately the patient dies, they can do a, a brain biopsy on autopsy. So what all things can be done with the samples? You can do a microscopy, you can do an antigen detection, DNA detection, virus isolation, and serological or antibody uh, to look for the uh, presence of this viral infection. So first of all, you have a microscopy that is what is called as a Zank smear. So it's a rapid and a sensitive method and a pretty cheap method also. So basically you uh, take the material from the base of the vesicles, stain it with 1% tolerant blue. So what you're going to see, you're going to see multinucleated giant cells with faceted nuclei and with a uh, the background will be uh, stained with a ground glass kind of an appearance. You can also do a GIMSA staining where you are going to look at or uh, look for the cowdrey type A inclusion bodies. But the problem is these inclusion bodies cannot differentiate between the different types of alpha viruses. That is, it cannot differentiate between chickenpox and the herpes simplex virus. If facilities permit, you can do a electron microscopy where you will be able to view the herpes virus. You can also do a fluorescent antibody staining, which can be confirmed with a PCR. Now, virus isolation, if you want to uh, throw the virus as such, you can do a choreolentoic membrane uh, 
uh, inoculation uh, or the uh, experimental animal mice is not very sensitive but you can try the tissue culture you can do a primary human embryonic kidney or human amnion or human diploid fibroblast so here uh, you can use the vesical fluid or the csf saliva swabs which can be used so what you look for you look for the uh, the uh, cytopathic effects within 24 to 48 hours and you will keep the cultures active for around two weeks where you can uh, look for the changes in the cells because of the virus and you can also do a drug susceptibility testing capita. The next part is the serology where you can do LISA or nucleization test, complement fixation test or even PCR can be done to look for this particular viruses. Treatment wise, you have, a, uh, if the patient is having eye and skin lesions, you can use a doxyuridin or acyclovir is one of the treatments what you give for herpes. Vitarabine is used for deep and systemic infections and uh, uh, valciclovir and fanciclovir are uh, kind of good as a oral agents. So this is basically about a very, uh, uh, well, a very small introduction of a herpes virus. I wouldn't say it on into too much of uh, details, but just for the understanding of what a herpes virus is. I hope you have understood and if there's any comments, please do let me know. Thank you.